most people are security driven. Most people don't achieve big And so it makes sense that everybody around you will tell you not to do it. This is a really, really deep topic that I like a lot. And I don't think I've talked as much about it as I really like to. What was young Alex Tremosley like growing up before you went off to college? I mean, I was a pretty quiet kid. It was just me and my dad for the most part. I had a Middle Eastern father. He was like, I got out of Iran because of school. And so do well in school and you too will succeed. And so that was, <laughs> that was kind of the path. I think as I got into high school, I came into myself a little bit more. I was a little bit of an angrier guy. I was more of a, I would say I was more of a lone wolf um, mm. during that period. From there, I, uh, I went to Vanderbilt and because uh, I did decently well at school, so I was able to get in. I was president mm -hmm. of fraternity, vice president of the powerlifting team. I did all that. And then when I got out and had my, my, my two years of consulting, it was a very miserable time for me. I was like, this is it. This is all there is. Like, it's just more of this for the rest of my life. And that was incredibly depressing to me. And so that was when I had to kind of challenge the original paradigm, which is maybe the plan that was laid out for me was not my plan, but someone else's plan. I'm making progress towards a goal that I do not want. But I knew that the guardrails were very high. Well, let's say stepping off the trail would have a very big fall for me to hit the ground in terms of my dad's viewpoint of me and my success, which was at the time all that I cared about. And so for me, it was really just not wanting to be alive, which became my kind of thing that got me to change which I was like, if I wake up every day hoping that I don't wake up, then either I can just live the rest of my life like this, or I can just die to somebody else. I was like, because right now I'm dead to me. And so that was kind of the internal dialogue was I have to die to my father in order to live for me. With fitness and gyms, and so you wanted to break out and learn from somebody else who had already done it. So tell us about that period of your life. Like, what did you learn at that gym? Why is it so important to get like, a volume of sales experience and things like that. So I learned sales when I started my own gym. So I emailed 40 gym owners because I knew from the consulting world, which is what I had graduated into, that the best way to learn is to seek out experts. And so they have already consolidated the information because there's no lack of information in the world. Like the issue is, is sifting through it at this point. And so finding people who've already pre-sifted it is more efficient. So I emailed 40 guys. He was the only one who got back to me. He had a seven-figure gym. His name was Seven Figure Sam. I worked for him at the gym, and he said I could be his apprentice because he didn't really have a program for me, so I just hung out with him all day. So he worked four to four. I would usually stay an extra couple hours until six because I didn't know anybody. During that period of time, it was kind of a crash course. I mean, imagine spending 12 hours a day with somebody who was a decent business owner at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a seven-figure business. There's just so much that I learned so quickly it's more like constructs. Like I didn't know things existed. It wasn't like I learned tactics. Like I just didn't even know email marketing was a thing. I didn't know affiliate marketing was a thing. I didn't know what a landing page was. I didn't know what ads were. I didn't know sales as a term existed. Like I didn't, I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And so anyways, I went to a workshop for a weekend. It was like $3,000, which was a tremendous amount of money for me at the time. They promised that you'd make $10,000 by the end of the weekend. I did not make $10,000 by the end of the weekend, but they taught Facebook marketing. And this mm. is 2013. And so I came back to Sam and I was like, hey, we should try this stuff. I think it's going to work. He said, I tried that. It doesn't work. And I was like, just give me, you know, give me a grand and I'll, I'll test it. So he said, I'll split the profit with you after, we, after I make my money back. And so I ran the ad the way I'd learned at the workshop and made $6,000. And true to his word, he gave me 2,500 bucks. And, uh, and that was kind of like the beginning of my taste into marketing. I'd love to talk about why it's okay to leave something good to go after something better and what you learned from that. Oh. I feel like this is such a big lesson. This is a really, really deep topic that I like a lot. And I don't think I've talked as much about it as I really like to. I think the hardest decisions in life are giving up good for great. And I think oftentimes what, what makes it hard is that your good is someone else's great who's casting their projection onto you and saying, why would you give up great? And so it's really just about expectations and standards that we set for ourselves and not buying into people's dreams about you that are smaller than your dreams for you. And so I think it's really just continually trading up dreams as you realize what you can do, right? Because mm -hmm. what is the path that I could see that I realistically think I can achieve given what I currently have? That mm -hmm. has continued to change over time. And it's the scariest thing to do is to trade what you have now. It's basically trading the one in the hand for the two in the bush. So it's going mm -hmm. counter the traditional common sense that people espouse. And most people are security driven. 
most people don't achieve big shit. And so it makes sense that everybody around you will tell you not to do it because mm -hmm. for most of them, it wouldn't make sense. And many times you will fail. And so the thing is, is that they will be right most of the time. But the thing is, is you only need to be right once. And that's the piece that I feel like is missed is that they will see someone try something on their own and then fail and then say, see, and then they will confirm their bias rather than thinking like, well, if I do this a hundred times, I only need one time to be successful, to be set up for the rest of my life. And so the biggest cost is time against expectations that we have for ourselves or rather that we adopt from other people. And so this is for the listeners. If you could fail for 10 straight years and then on your 11th year, make a $2 million a year business, you are further along than the person who made $100,000 a year that entire period of time. Mm -hmm. It's just people measure outcomes on too short of an interval. And that's why they don't get what they want. Because the goals that they have, because they measure with such a small interval, they can't see success anyways. Right? It's like you can't make a billion dollars in a year. It's just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Like no one, I don't, I don't think there's anybody who's made it from zero to a billion in a year. I, I, I could maybe nowadays, who knows? But like, it's right. But but if you extend it on ten, anyone can do it. Yeah, and also people don't understand your experience, what you've done for yourself. Yeah. You know what failures you've had in the past, how you've learned, and sometimes these big hard jumps actually have the most reward. So I know you can, you know, attest to that. I have the belief that when I die, people will come to my funeral, people will argue over my belongings, over who gets what. People will think that some people shouldered more of the responsibility of dealing with my funeral and my death than other people. People will wanna get fed. And uh, some people will not be able to make it because something came up. And two months, three months, two years after I die, I will never be mentioned again. And mm -hmm. so if people are not going to even care to show up to my funeral. Why would I let them have any say over my life? Yeah. And so a lot of it was unlearning projected judgments that I believed people had over the actions that I was taking when they weren't even thinking about me at all, nor do they really care. Like hmm. you get a hater comment, it ruins some person's day, but like they don't really care about you. Like they don't care. Yeah. You have this whole life and the whole time we're catering it to a lot of beliefs that other people have about us. And we don't take actions and we put things off for years, decades, because of judgment that isn't real, it's made, made up. And it's just hard to unlearn that. And so I think for me, that's believing that things don't have inherent meaning and then that we have the choice to ascribe whatever meaning we want to things has been very liberating for me in terms of how I can approach business, timelines mm -hmm. that I can ascribe to success, how I see marriage, like, you know, all of yeah. these things. Despite my proclivity for wanting to do more things, it has been the hardest, hardest one character trait I have is being able to focus. Yeah. And I have to by far. And it seems like once you focused, that's when things really started to take off. So can you talk to us about why it's important to minimize headspace and focus on the vehicle that gives us the most return? So if you think about progress in anything, you have volume of activity times leverage equals output in any system. So how many times you do something? times how much you get for each time you do it equals what you get overall. Mm -hmm. And so the first thing that people need to do is maximize their activity. So if you're lazy, you procrastinate, et cetera, you have to get over that first. You got to do something, right? Once you start doing stuff, you very quickly maximize your, your, your time, right? Like you start working 16 hours a day, basically you sleep and you work, right? Mm -hmm. But then how is it that some people can work 16 hours a day and other people can work 16 hours a day and the person, person two makes 1000 times more than person one? Well, it's because of the second piece, which is leverage. And so a lot of times people think they need to do more things rather than doing more of the one thing. Mm. And you get your outsized returns by getting better, not by necessarily even doing more. And so what I mean by that is like, so leverage is defined by the difference between inputs and outputs in a system. And so that means that if I put one input and I get more output, I have high leverage. If I put a lot of input and little input, little output, then I have low leverage. Mm. And so a high leverage activity gives you more for what you put in. And so... The thing is, is that activity is limited with time, right? Time, focus, energy, et cetera. But leverage is not. And so the idea is if we can pursue higher leverage opportunities, things that get us more for our time, then we will make significantly more and very quickly outpace the activity, which is why mm -hmm. I'm not working 16. 
and I still make significantly more because the leverage multiplier is so high. And I work this much because I enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I could work less. I just like working. There's a fallacy for newer entrepreneurs, which is that like, I'm going to try four things and see which one hits. But the reality is that all four of them could hit, but none of them will hit if you try to do all four. And so I think most times you have to reconcile the fact that like, you just need to focus on one thing. And most times people will just not confront the hard thing because like, there is a reason your one business is not working. Solve that problem. Some people think they have a leads problem when the reality is that their product sucks, mm. right? And that's all, especially with newer entrepreneurs. Like my stuff's so good. If, if people just knew about it, well, it's like, well, do you have customers? Like, well, yeah, I have customers. It's like, well, people do know about it and they don't tell their friends. So why don't we solve that problem? I feel like a lot of people, they don't spend enough time on their goals. To your point, they're going from shiny object to shiny object to shiny object, and then they never get really good at something to be exceptional yeah. and become super, super successful. I'd love to understand how that focus enabled you to believe in yourself more. I'm not a big believer in affirmations and things like that. I think a lot of people are like, fake it till you make it and that kind of thing. And I think that there's a lot of like chest beating to try and posture. And I personally, that doesn't work for me because what, what that makes me feel like is a liar. And so if I am not confident about something is my belief that it is because I do not have evidence that I should be good. Mm. And so it's like, if I want to say that I'm good at sales, well, I could claim to be good at sales, but wouldn't it be so much better to just have a thousand closed deals and say, I think it would be reasonable to say that I'm good at sales, mm. right? Like I just have evidence. And then that way I don't need to have it. I don't need to have bravado. I just have fact. And then it makes it much less postury. It's like, this is just what it is. And it just makes it, for me, much more black and white. And it also gives me something to focus on, which I think is the real benefit of this, is that people are trying to trick their mindset when really they just need to change their circumstances. Mm. They need to give themselves evidence to why they are good. And that that is a workable equation. You just do more and you get better. And all, of, all the best returns in life come from the diminishing returns at the end. So I'll give you a quick example for everyone who's listening. So like if you sprint a lot, mm -hmm. right? If you're a sprinter and you go to the Olympics, the difference between the first place Olympics and the fourth place Olympics is like a 10th of a second or whatever it is, right? But the real difference in real life outcome between gold and not on the pedestal is everything. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that when people spread themselves thing, they never give themselves the opportunity to get the outsized returns that happen at the end. Being the best salesman in the world compared to being a top 10% salesman in the world, the difference in income between those two things is probably 50 million a year. And your value in the marketplace skyrockets. Mm. And that's the thing that people don't allow themselves to unlock. They keep pursuing new rather than pursuing better. And when you're a new entrepreneur, here's the human behavior behind this. You get reinforced for changing path. You were in corporate, you go to a job, you get positive reinforcement. You get some freedom, you might make more money, whatever it is, right? You get positive reinforcement. And so you learn a lesson that's the wrong lesson. You learn that changing is the key to entrepreneurship, but you only have to change once, which mm. is you have to quit the thing to start the next thing. And then after that, you have to unlearn the character trait that got you there and learn a new trait, which is discipline and focus, and then keep doing this new path for an extended period of time, so much so that it'd be unreasonable that you would suck. And at that point, people ask you how you did it. So good. I would advise everybody to rewind that part of this show back.